Hello and welcome to the CyberRes Universe 2022. Today's session is Voltage Data Protection in the Hybrid World. I am Sid Dutta, um, part of uh, Voltage Product Management, responsible for Voltage Secure Data. Uh, with me, I have Anthony Knight. Anthony, would you like to say hello to the audience? Yes. Hi, thanks very much, Sid. Yes, uh, as Sid said, I'm Anthony Knight. I'm also on the product management team. And for my side, I'm dealing with the Voltage Secure Mail and Smart Cipher solution. Thanks, Sid. Thanks, Anthony. So today we have a you know pretty exciting uh, agenda you know for this session. Uh, so this is kind of the highlight of it. Uh, so we're going to take you through uh, some of those areas of where Voltage is actually working um, and. Uh, some of the um, areas where you would be interested uh, in understanding our strategy and roadmap uh, and, and the things that uh, we have already delivered um, in the context of this uh, session, uh, which is uh, how we are being cloud neutral and, and uh, providing the hybrid cloud support. Uh, so with that, uh, we will get into uh, the first section. Obviously, you know, we're talking about data here. Now, it's uh, interesting that you know, every company uh, today uh, is a data company. Uh, Thomas uh, H. Davenport, um, he was an academic and author specializing in analytics, uh, business process, innovation, knowledge management, and uh, artificial intelligence. He said uh, that every company has big data in its future, and every company will eventually be in the data business. And then how true is that, right? Because it's uh, undeniable that as a culture, you know, we have uh, entered uh, into an age of data. Now, typically, uh, we talk about the big data, and essentially, you know, how big is uh, big data? Uh, so that term uh, is relative uh, to the available computing and storage power on the market. Uh, so back in, let's say, 1999, you know, one gigabyte was considered to be a big data. Uh, today, in, uh, you know, it may consist of petabytes or exabytes of information, including billions or even you know trillions of records from uh, millions of people. And as you can see from uh, this uh, diagram, that uh, how the global data sphere has actually evolved, you know, since you know pre to twenty tens and all the way how it's projected uh, to twenty twenty five. And you're seeing that you know what uh, different areas and use cases and industry verticals are contributing to this you know, data explosion. Now, just machine-generated data accounts for like almost 40 to 50% uh, of internet data. But thankfully, we have you know, data visualization tools to make all this data understandable. The size of Hadoop and big data uh, you know, between 2017 and 2022, uh, that you can see that how in, in the US uh, dollars, uh, it's up to like 100 uh, billion in just in 2022. So that's kind of the growth and the explosion that has been happening in the market. Now with, you know, of course, the data explosion, you know, comes the opportunity of data monetization as well. So as data is collected, you know, it's it's cleaned and uh, it's uh, analyzed, and then essentially it becomes information. And from information, you know, you derive knowledge uh, to, you know, derive critical business insights. And then you put, you know, those, uh, insights into actions and analytics is, is playing a big role in there and data monetization obviously at that point of time is is uh, a fancy way of saying that how you make money you know from your data so whether your organization is a data producer or data aggregator or data consumer uh, you have the potential to generate new revenue streams through data monetization uh, and of course yeah, you know the value can be achieved across a broad spectrum of analytical activities and uh, data can be also leveraged across disparate disciplines, you know, whether you're driving uh, new products, you know, based on data, uh, you're managing your client lifecycle, uh, your internal cost optimization, how you're driving your sales, uh, cross sell, the next, you know, best product, you know, to name a few. Another thing that's happening in the industry is obviously rapid cloud adoption, right? And some of these are also driven out of uh, uh, the data explosion. Um, and you can see you know, the three big ones, AWS, Azure, Google, um, you know, kind of leading. And of course, there are other you know, cloud that uh, customers are also adopting. The other side, um, what are they really using um, you know, in, the, in the cloud? 
Now, a lot of them are related to uh, the data explosion. Now, when it comes to some of the critical uh, business critical application, the more sensitive application, there is still a model where enterprises actually, you know, keep them on premises and manage those, you know, very internally. Um, but with the, so much of uh, data, um, you know, coming in from various sources, the amount of infrastructure and the expertise and then the capital that's uh, involved uh, in analyzing those data uh, within their on-premises infrastructure, on-premises data center, is, is becoming so much cost prohibitive. Cloud becomes a very natural um, and a viable choice for them. Uh, so as you can see from, from the chart, uh, the data warehouse, uh, database as a service, you know, these are kind of those top services you know, that um, enterprises are adopting. And it just makes sense you know, to leverage the practically infinite scale of cloud. Uh, and their infrastructure and then the scalability and the uh, resiliency uh, that the cloud offers inherently, and then push those data in there and, and uh, derive those you know, critical business uh, insights out of there. So 95 plus percentage of, of customers um, are maintaining this hybrid model. In a lot of cases, you know, some uh, enterprises are cloud first. Um, and very few of them are probably, you know, cloud only. But in, in most cases, enterprises are adopting this hybrid model where some of those critical business functions are still being managed um, on premises. But a lot of these data driven you know, huge um, analytics workloads are being moved to the cloud. And not that, you know, they're not using uh, cloud for uh, other you know, business applications as you know, in case where there's a new uh, application or business function being uh, developed, a lot of enterprises are adopting, you know, the the cloud first approach uh, because of uh, the capability to use their uh, container services, their database services, serverless compute, which essentially doesn't require any sort of infrastructure to be pre-provisioned, and then it's on demand. And then, of course, you know, you've got machine learning and AI, um, and a lot of those cases, IoT, you know, and in general, those services are also being leveraged as evident, you know, from the uh, schematic here. Well, with um, rapid adoption of cloud and uh, a huge uh, migration of uh, the data to the cloud, uh, we are also seeing um, the rise of data breaches. And of course, you know, their cost, the poor security practices, you know, complicated controls, rush technology pro programs are uh, causing a rash of data breaches stemming from the use of cloud services. And it's, it's uh, very interesting that uh, misconfiguration remains the number one cause of data breaches in the cloud. Uh, sometimes the lack of awareness of cloud security, you know, policies or you know, lack of adequate controls and oversight, you know, too many cloud APIs uh, and interfaces, uh, and of course, not ignoring negligent insider behavior. You know, they all contribute. Of course, we've got uh, um, several privacy regulations, um, you know, on top of uh, the industry standards and regulations that were already there, um, and the fines and the penalties, uh, you know, for uh, misusing data and uh, not implementing adequate controls. Um, so those are also increasing. Um, and we have seen uh, a significant uh, rise in the cost of data breaches. And uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, the cost of uh, data breach as reported by, you know, IBM Security, the Ponemon Institute, um, it has gone up by 10%. Now, in a cloud-first and a hybrid world, you know this notion of, you know, of course, your data is your risk. Uh, you know, that that's something that uh, a lot of enterprises uh, ignore in the aspect of when they move stuff to the cloud. Sometimes uh, they forget about, you know, what really the cloud providers are offering and and what's really they are responsible for. So this. Um, shared responsibility model, and I've kind of uh, used uh, AWS, uh, their own shared responsibility model as an example, uh, this notion of responsibility uh, for security in the cloud and the responsibility for security off the cloud. So there's a very 
in a clear distinction, you know, what uh, the cloud providers are responsible for and what uh, we or enterprises uh, who are using the cloud and then putting in their application and workloads and data in there, what they are responsible for. Uh, so that needs to be understood. Now I can tell you, you know, from my personal experience, you know, being on the enterprise for, uh, you know, almost you know, 20 years, um, that the adoption of cloud has gone through its own life cycle. Right, especially for large regulated enterprises from being never cloud or don't even mention the C word <laughs> to, OK, we can put some sensitive workloads to the cloud, um, you know, or basically uh, there has to be some controls that needs to be put in place before you know, we can move um, to whatever we build will be built for the cloud. Right, so there's, there's a big uh, journey that enterprises have covered. You know, even when you know cloud started to become you know relevant and uh, important. So, to cloud or not to cloud, you know that battle. Uh, typically, nine out of ten times, uh, the business units actually win, uh, given there is uh, you know, a lot of uh, business potential and there's financial uh, advantages you know to it. Um, but on the other side. You know, how does security enable uh, responsible business innovation? Uh, that as actually is a big challenge, you know, for uh, security organization, you know, CISOs and, and uh, uh, chief risk officers. So with uh, the model of enabling business units to cl use cloud security with, you know, data security and privacy, you know, identity access management baked into the design, that doesn't disrupt the business processes. You know that has been, you know, kind of uh, uh, the mantra, you know, for for a lot of organizations. I'll be the first one to agree that you know cloud providers, in a lot of cases, have better security controls and tools uh, than most of the enterprises who are trying to implement uh, that on premises. So migrating to the cloud, you know, no longer need to be perceived as reducing the security, but uh, given that there are quite a few. Uh, opportunities for misconfigurations and you know uh, uh, inadequate learning or understanding of those controls uh, given that there are so many of those and layers of it um, you know data breaches are still happening so basically um, you know given the nature of the cloud and how it's built and how they are managed how they are shared what sort of and how much control enterprises have um, and even with various security tools and controls they offer, it's still up to the enterprise uh, to make sure that they own the risk and the remediation. And of course, you know, cloud providers don't address everything, you know, from a security standpoint. Um, and in certain cases, uh, when you're dealing with a hybrid or even a multi-cloud model, uh, you are required to have something that uh, spans across, you know, your on-premises and your cloud and your multiple cloud. So native uh, cloud security controls, uh, you know, work within the perimeters of that particular cloud provider. But as soon as you, you know, have multi-cloud model or you're managing workloads between on-premises and cloud, you know, you need a solution that obviously you know can span across. So what has Voltage really done in terms of uh, uh, providing that? multi-cloud, cloud agnostic, cloud neutral, and hybrid you know, support, right? So we, uh, you know, we have talked about this uh, many times about, you know, how um, our solutions, uh, you know, can be deployed on premises and the cloud, but obviously uh, the strategy was to make it more cloud native and more cloud integrated. So as workloads are moving to the cloud, you know, our solutions need to be cloud native as well. You know, we can't, uh, really uh, provide uh, a model um, that deployment of our solutions, you know, working the way it used to work, you know, 20, 30 years back, uh, where uh, hosting appliances and hosting, um, you know, virtual machines or physical hardware, uh, as we did, you know, back in the days in the on-premises, and that we can just lift and shift that same model into the cloud and make it work. So those those days are yesteryears. So basically, if security solutions can be deployed as any other critical business application in the cloud, the customers you know won't find our solutions attractive, regardless of the umpteen number of rich features and capabilities we have. 
So we, we, we got, you know, that message, you know, very clear that how gradually as the workloads are moving to the cloud, they want to make sure in our solutions also, you know, our cloud native, they can be orchestrated uh, in the way the rest of the applications are getting orchestrated, how they are being reported against, how they are being managed, how they are being audited, how they are being monitored, you know, how they are being alerted, you know, for certain events and stuff. So we've actually done uh, quite a bit of work on that in making, you know, Voltage uh, essentially cloud native, cloud neutral, and, you know, uh, for hybrid as well. So as um, this diagram actually starts showing is that we've essentially started to transform our monolith into microservices. And of course, you know, that model uh, has been uh, implemented uh, by choosing some of the you know, technologies that are current and uh, very, very popular across the enterprises and across the industry. So we have adopted Docker, you know, as our container runtime and uh, Kubernetes as our container orchestration platform with, you know, HEM, um, you know, being those uh, infrastructure as code capabilities that we are shipping scripts to automate and streamline the deployment of our voltage solutions. And uh, it's cloud neutral, so we have support for um, public clouds, you know, like AWS, Azure, Google, and even, you know, private cloud uh, where uh, a lot of enterprises actually have invested in their own platform as a service stack, uh, which are uh, using Kubernetes and Docker, uh, you know, within their stack. And we continue to support uh, the old model of uh, uh, you know, appliances as well, you know, virtual appliances uh, that uh, you know, a lot of cases, you know, on-premises, uh, uh, currently it's deployed across hundreds of customers and, and in other cases, uh, you know, in the cloud as well. So it's a, it's an architecture that has evolved, you know, from our traditional appliance to uh, a set of microservices that are containerized that can be orchestrated like any other business application in the cloud, whether it's public or you know, it's a private cloud. So I don't want to, you know, get into too much of detail in the diagram, but it just kind of shows uh, quite a bit of detail in terms of the integrations. But everything in the cloud is an API, and our products, you know, has to be, you know, API based uh, so that they can interoperate. And all of these microservices that you see in these, you know, white boxes, uh, these are components. Uh, that have now been isolated and separated and working independently, you know, within the uh, Kubernetes clusters, and they talk to each other, you know, via APIs. So the term loose coupling and uh, high cohesion, it's an architectural and engineering discipline, especially in the, you know, microservices world. So we kind of adopted that part uh, because in a lot of cases, our solutions are also integrating with third-party applications or even cloud services, you know, applications, you know, whether it's a secrets vault, whether it's their key management service, whether it's their identity provider, uh, whether it's uh, their database service uh, or it's a logging and monitoring service. Uh, so all of these, you know, are interacting, you know, via APIs. And as we integrate the various uh, solutions within uh, the Voltage portfolio under the common data privacy and uh, protection platform, um, it's ne it needs to be API driven, right? And extensible where not only our solutions could interoperate, uh, but third party solutions can also. So while we prefer our customers to realize the value of the overall solutions um, and consume the integrated solution suite, but in the real world, customer needs to be empowered to choose the best uh, of the breed as well. So sometimes they will bring in their own uh, capabilities and services and would expect in our solutions to integrate to. And we have created that model uh, that we can uh, support uh, that uh, requirement. Well, as I mentioned about cloud native, but we're also talking about you know, cloud integrations, right? So as data and workloads are moving to the cloud, you know, whether, uh, you know, they are server-based or serverless, you know, whether uh, they need to be integrated with clients or REST APIs, uh, we have basically integrated, um, you know, and injected, you know, voltage in the path of that data migration, you know, right from the point where data is getting ingested 
um, and data getting discovered and data getting visualized. So in this slide, you will probably see, um, uh, and I've used AWS as one of the examples, but you can essentially just uh, uh, replace this with Azure and Google. Uh, the, the picture is not going to really change that much you know, conceptually. So today, enterprise and uh, business users, you know, they are putting a lot of you know data into the cloud via different sources. You know, whether it's you know there's file uploads into object storage services, you know, like S3, and in those cases, there are a lot of sensitive data that's being injected. And one of the areas where uh, uh, data breaches happen is that when these uh, buckets, S3 buckets, are you know publicly accessible and or uh, the identities uh, that have access to the buckets have been actually compromised. So anyone can you know, get access to the buckets and uh, basically get access to sensitive data. So we have essentially built an integration uh, using the uh, serverless functions capability that uh, the cloud providers offer, in this case, AWS Lambda. And uh, we allow uh, S3 to trigger uh, a function as soon as a file is dropped and Voltage uh, essentially operates on that file to protect the sensitive data and load the file back in a protected manner. Uh, so we're applying the data-centric security um, and not uh, having the customers rely on server-side encryption or any sort of perimeter or access control mechanisms to protect those data in, in those object storage. So of course, you know, it's just not files. You know, we've got um, you know, unstructured data um, you know, and uh, databases from on-premises, uh, social media feeds, Internet of Things, all of these, uh, you know, are, are essentially sources uh, of data that's moving to the cloud and, you know, essentially leveraging some of these cloud-hosted uh, um, data warehouse or analytics services. Uh, you know, for that data to get stored and analyzed and visualized and then critical insights derived out of it. Now, of course, you know, there are several tools um, that are making these uh, data migration happen. You know, it could be the ETL, you know, services, whether it's uh, leveraging uh, a cloud services provider ETL uh, like AWS Glue or some of the popular uh, ETL uh, tools like Informatica, Ab Initio, you know, Talent, IBM Data Stage. In a lot of cases, our customers are you know, using our own utilities like Secure Data File Processor uh, to protect data uh, while they're migrating to the cloud. So Voltage has you know, integrated with all of these services um, you know, through our APIs. And in other cases, you know, data is probably getting streamed, you know, whether it's you know, through uh, the streaming platforms, uh, services like Kinesis or you know, Kafka, you know, IoT, uh, NiFi, you know, stream sets, uh, or you know, putting in a message queue or like an AWS uh, simple queue service. And in those cases, we have integrated uh, either natively uh, with these uh, platforms or uh, in a decoupled fashion you know, via a serverless function invocation. Uh, so yeah, using AWS Lambda as well. And of course, you know, with Google and Azure, you have the similar uh, functions available for what we call as functions as a service. And these data are being injected now in a protected manner, uh, given that voltage integration exists across all of these, uh, into these data warehouse services. And they are, they are staying there protected uh, at a field level. Um, and not only that, sometimes you know you have uh, existing uh, resident data in, in these services, which uh, discovery tools uh, can go and find. Right? You've got AWS Macy, which is the native uh, AWS service, but then we also have um, you know Voltage, Cerberus, uh, discovery uh, platforms like you know uh, Structured Data Manager or File Analysis Suite that can basically go and and uh, you know search. Um, uh, and look for sensitive data and then invoke uh, a trigger for a voltage uh, transformation if there are any resident data that are uh, still not protected. So we build those integrations as well. And um, last, of course, when data is already there in these analytics platform protected, you know, data engineers, business uh, intelligence users, data scientists are the cataloging that data and now they have to you know run some of the visualization uh, reports on it uh, they want to analyze the data 
So our integrations have happened you know, either directly you know, with these uh, different uh, visualization tools or you know, when we're running in sort of uh, ML or AI you know, for, uh, workloads. So these could be native integrations um, that we have built, uh, could be through our interception technology like voltage sentry, could be through serverless functions that entirely decoupled um, or could be natively with the cloud data warehouse platforms as well. And in a lot of cases, um, even those uh, cloud data warehouses are also triggering you know, voltage lambda functions or, or any sort of uh, functions as a service, depending on which cloud you're in. Sharing of uh, anonymized data or pseudonymized data to third parties, you know, those are also something you know, that are very popular use cases where we can expose um, or allow customers to basically selectively um, give authorized providers to look into the data or uh, you know, send the data in an anonymized and pseudonymized fashion you know, for analytics purposes, for outsourcing purposes. So modern use cases and problems require modern solutions. So in a lot of cases, uh, we have taken advantage of the innovations you know, that the cloud services providers have brought to the table. And uh, we've uh, followed suit. In a lot of cases, you know, we have gotten to the point of innovation and cloud services providers have partnered with us you know, to leverage our innovations to make cloud more attractive and secure you know, for our enterprises to adopt. With that, I'm going to hand over to Anthony, uh, who's going to take us through our next set of content uh, on secure information share. Um, as it mentioned previously, uh, today every company is a data company. So what I thought I could touch on here is a few of the enterprise data trends, which while creating obviously mutual business opportunities, they're also creating a lot of concern. The companies are, are doing customer analytics, um, but now more than ever, they're moving away from, as you mentioned, these costly enterprise data, where, data warehouse platforms and on-premise infrastructure towards more cost-effective analytic SaaS platforms. Finally, the companies are looking for cyber resilience and there's growing recognition of the need for adaptive solutions to protect, detect and evolve on a continual basis. And with this rapid cloud approach, I wanted to discuss in particular secure information sharing and collaboration in, in the cloud and importantly through our data privacy and protection solution for detection, classification and how you will be able to improve your confidence level so that when collaborating both internally and externally, you and your organization as well as your users are protected no matter where the data is and equally important through the full life of that data. So to get started, let's talk about the data trends and the explosion of the data, both structured and unstructured, and what that introduces. A good example here is cloud collaboration and the fact that it's now so simple, easy, and very necessary, especially given how we've seen with the pandemic, which has expedited and prioritized the way we interact with each other with data. So with the employees having now been working remotely, now in many cases for two years or more, meaning that they use the cloud more than ever. So, so what does this mean? Well, they're able to access and work together on documents and other data. This data is stored nearly everywhere, including such places as home devices, network shares. And so accessing such examples as Office 365 or Google Docs, et cetera. But it, it's not stopping there. And as employees and partners access cloud-based collaboration shares as well, they're editing and working together on projects through all these documents. So what we can see is that the change to the work environment has been consistently hitting the news cycle, with leading enterprises being up to 100% remote. So we can see the office as we knew it is going through a huge change, which is why we have been seeing a major push to take advantage of the cloud, enabling everyone to potentially edit at any time and also together at the same time. And of course, as I mentioned, people are now even using their own personal devices when they hit uh, issues and problems. So here mentioned on this slide, typically we find that 
80 to 90 percent of unstructured data is going unused and unchecked, uh, which is considered dark data as it exposes the organization to privacy regulations such as GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, and CCPA, for our own California consumer privacy. Uh, these regulation requirements now include the possibility of, of penalties which I know everyone is aware of. And, and if this is not done or the data gets lost, well, then, of course, this is a significant financial issue. Given this potential exposure, we have called out the data protection side, which you will hear more about later. But to sum it up, is that data is what is the most relevant and how we protect that data ultimately is extremely critical and therefore also plays a key role in data privacy. So for key challenges, or rather to put it another way, cloud collaboration challenges facing businesses, we've already mentioned previously, and to reiterate and expand what we're seeing these challenges through. So data explosion for unstructured and structured data. Employees are creating data that's going unused and unchecked, which is known as dark data. Data being saved to personal devices to obviously make users' lives easier and to speed up response times. This is opening users up to making more mistakes, such as passing through uh, personal identifiable information, either through file sharing or through emails or images. A personal and company email used to transfer files to be able to work more efficiently and to get these attachments through when company emails block them. So they're, they're using their own, they will transfer from their corporate email to their private email so that they can move that information through. So in reality, though, this is creating a lot more cases of being exposed to a breach. And the lack of control of the data, and so visibility is often lost on this file. And this can be as innocent as being unable to use your home printer. I mean, for a workaround there, you send it to a local machine rather than using your corporate machine. And now you have it in your Gmail account. And while you've sent that through and you've been able to print it, you've forgotten about it, it stays there. So again, it's about the visibility of those documents. So monitoring of data becomes harder as users move from various devices under, not under the sort of, uh, management of, and of course, no one has any idea who has that data, where it is, what they're doing with it, who copied it and pasted relevant information elsewhere. So through our research and feedback, as well as obviously our own needs as well, we see that what's needed is an adapted framework of solutions. With the market trends and the customer challenges, the data working in a siloed system with separate security approaches are truly behind it. We all need to pro provide efficient, consistent, and secure access to the most valuable of our corporate assets and to be able to move forward successfully. In other words, what's needed now is a complete, reliable, adaptive, and automated approach to navigate the world of data protection and privacy. So, so why is it important? Well, I just wanted to briefly capture the challenges that business values that we see. Um, we have regulated pressures such as GDPR and CCPA, uh, which are creating requirements for data detection, protection, policies, audit, and obviously classification. This will and obviously does keep many people up at night uh, with the fact that sensitive data is moving to the cloud without protection or encryption, which is all due to the threats of fines and sanctions, which are steep enough to financial cripple most companies. We have modernization of business questions here. What type of data do we have? Users are keeping this information forever and in some cases have no idea where it is multiple versions of the files with no visibility on just how many there are. And then we have business disruption. So we were seeing all the time, as I mentioned, due to remote workforce, and thanks to that pandemic, this is now the new norm. Again, no one knows who has access to the files or where they are. We have seen cases where contractors are being hired. They in turn are subcontracting out without telling the primary customer. This is leading to not only loss of personal identifiable information, but also loss of IP. And of course, more importantly, a loss of trust of the primary. We also have an explosion on distributed teams. It's getting more difficult as costs rise. And so 
does the use of local cost center increase? And in order for it to be more efficient through more domain knowledge has to be shared to reduce the cost in the organization's HQ. So how do you share more information and also track and manage that data on top of the customers are now requesting info from their vendors to declare if they use offshore companies? And this is again leading to more regulatory compliance requirements. So to call out data protection in, in particular here, as I mentioned on the previous slide, organizations are blocking moving sensitive data to the cloud without protection or encryption. But data privacy and protection is more of a continuous process of understanding information, assessing risk, taking action, and managing all aspects around that information, including access, retention, disposition, over its lifetime of that data. So for data protection, when we discuss protective action in the unstructured data, we're talking about encryption, but also through analyzing the data, we can find the sensitive information and use encryption to protect the personal identifiable information. Obviously, this means that even if there is a breach, it doesn't damage the organization. We make sure that our business users who have the right permission to see, to view, edit, and protecting this data in place in real time. So when the protection, so when protected from an encryption standpoint through our product, we are protecting the future use of the data. We are using transparent, persistent encryption, which in turn is helping the business stay agile by not locking them down. The additional benefit here is the business is not losing productivity, which we find is a major plus. For example, we use transparent encryption on smart cipher sites. This encryption actually follows the data around, ensuring the permissible user can access that information at any time. This is also true if we moved around to another device, as it will stay protected for the lifetime of the data, no matter where it's moved to. Sometimes that has been highlighted recently with the pandemic, where data is being moved. So what is Smart Cipher? So, by the way, a quick introduction of a new solution we have is our Voltage Smart Cipher. We do unstructured data needs and collaboration efforts. Smart Cipher combines critical technology features into a single solution for privacy and security. It simplifies compliance and risk control with a single solution that's transparent and works with any data type on premise or in the cloud. It includes data loss prevention file encryption, discovery, classification, and access control features that are critical to privacy. It simplifies achieving privacy requirements for all data, it delivers control over sensitive files for secure collaboration, and improves privacy compliance through monitoring, reporting, and alerting. So I wanted to talk very quickly about the unstructured uh, use cases or it actually applies to all here. But while there are lots of different use cases that can be addressed with our products such as file analysis suite or data discovery, smart cipher, or indeed with our secure mail, they can be grouped together under the following three categories here. So we have enable cybersecurity. Companies are focused on security requirements. An example here might be I have intellectual property that I need to collaborate on with several third parties, which may include legal or financial information, and in which case the sensitive information, security is mandated and needs to follow an internal company rules. And also look at it from a secure collaboration side, where businesses now more than ever, as we've mentioned, need and do collaborate extensively and will use the easiest method possible to interact and disperse teams and try to balance security and productivity. Typically, this can be done through email, as well as cloud storage and files on demand, such as OneDrive, Google Drive. This means we don't have the visibility into what's going on in those particular areas. And so ultimately, we are losing control of that data. Current resolutions here are to focus on the collaboration platform itself, which this is something that we don't do, as we focus on the data in the file itself. This allows the user or the business to collaborate in any method they want, and obviously, Voltage Smart Cipher is focused on controlling access and protecting that data while monitoring and reporting on that usage. So as you can see, 
enable cybersecurity, secure collaboration, complement each other very well by giving our customers the, the peace of mind to securely collaborate using whatever method typically used today and not forcing you into a fenced off IT delivered solution that may not fully meet your needs. Another solution being implemented is more on the DLP type or data loss prevention type solution that we find products are more focused on blocking certain types of activity. As we all know, when you block users, they will find a way to be productive. They will find another way to do what they have to do or rather what they need to do. Of course, Smart Cypher doesn't mind this and even other methods can be used to share or move files a smart cipher will monitor, protect, and restrict data at all times, no matter where that file or data goes. In our third category here, I've mentioned privacy, compliance, and audit. So it's become more important over Europe and Asia Pacific due to GDPR. Businesses globally are obviously trying to meet requirements around the various new privacy regulation um, of GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, the California Consumer Privacy, New York Privacy Act, just to mention a few and others which require them to monitor and access control, as well as the usage of the customer's personal identifiable information, regardless of where it is. Things like the right to be begotten, all kinds of other things come into play. So these regulatory requirements now include the possibility of penalty. And if it's not done or the data is lost, which of course are significant ones, hence they're looking for solutions they can do this with data, but also importantly, make sure not to break the workflow in the company or reduce the productivity. So Smart Cypher and Secure Mail, one of our legacy products on the Vault is Secure Mail side or email protection. So we've been bringing our portfolio together, products which where we are integrating, integrating Secure Mail with Smart Cipher. The aim here is to simplify requirements and improve confidence that when your users are working with email and especially attachments to collaborate, you can be sure that these files will continue to be protected, even if they're downloaded or the content is copied to another file. The Smart Cipher classification and protection policies will be applied at the end point, which is which is what Smart Cipher is all about. And this integration of Secure Mail and Smart Cipher is so important because it allows for many operations to now be automated and also fully transparent. For example, encryption of an unstructured data used to require that you would apply the encryption. And then in order to read that, you would have to remove it. The smart cipher will now make this happen transparently in secure mail, meaning users don't need to be relied upon to protect the right information at the right time. Also, now you gain visibility and control over how those files are used, and so meet your privacy compliance requirements. So while secure mail has the ability when used as recommended to secure all the sensitive information through emails, as well as attachments, a big ask that we've been, has been made to us to make the process simpler, to bring in better lifetime protection for attachments as well as make sure users are encrypting the right content, even if they forget to click stay on the send secure button. This new integration allows us to have Smart Cypher and Secure Mail work better together. And with Smart Cypher, this is now possible. And we have combined the two products through policies within Smart Cypher. This means that previously, where a user sent an encrypted email with an attachment, they now have the confidence to know that that protection will stay with that data, with the file, even when the end user downloads the attachment, something that's not possible with secure mail at the moment. Given that this was once the attachment was downloaded from the mail, it would lose its protection and its monitoring. So as mentioned, secure mail works with your Outlook. So when you have a document and decide it's sensitive, it will need to be sent encrypted. You use the send secure button to then send across to the recipient. And after receiving it, they would decrypt it and save the file attachment, which would then be decrypted. So this file now saves on the recipient's desktop. And even though you've made sure you sent it securely, the file is now sitting there without any protection or monitoring. 
Let's also not forget, you had to make a conscious decision to actually click the send secure button, which unfortunately we have found is something users tend to forget until it's too late. So this has been a major driver for us to build up the integration between Smart Cipher and Secure Mail to make sending secure emails and attachments simpler, easier, as well as seamless to the end user. If I need to send an encrypted email and I forget to click send secure, then Smart Cipher Sensor will continue to now be able to check the email and any documents to evaluate against any policies in Smart Cipher to determine whether or not the content or attachments need to be decrypted or encrypted and who should be able to have access and how they can interact with that file. Again, importantly and worth noting is this all happens as I click on a single button. It will alert the user to the fact that to ask them if they want to continue, then they're going to need to encrypt so Smart Cipher can send it out, thereby giving them the ability to opt out or cancel or just go ahead and follow those through the workflow and send it protectively. So, so why do we need this? Or so, I mean, why do we think this integration is better? Well, it's simple because bringing Smart Cipher adds the following. It applies persistent protection and controls, protects attachments for the lifetime of the data. It controls actions such as print, forward, and disallowing copying. It centralizes policies for email and attachments. It educates users through alerts and reports back to administration. It extends Smart Site with transparent and persistent file encryption, plus all policy inspection and usage controls into exchange, email, message body, and obviously attachments. So for data privacy are on, on, on our side for the next steps, we're creating a creating a proper data protection strategy as part of our cyber resilience, starting with data discovery, where you need to be able to take full inventory of all the data that is used within the organization, structured or unstructured. With this data understanding, you can also establish the risk exposure that you have today. So, for example, discovery is not enough to only look at databases or to meta files, but really it's its content and to do a deep analysis and inspection of all file types, whether it's text, audio, video. But it doesn't stop there and it requires you to have a full view on how the data can be assessed. accessed, And in many cases is not always obvious. So when you when you have the data, you can now work on minimizing and exposing to bring the privacy by design into your environment. The way you likely monitor today is by looking at logs from file shares, databases, applications. So in essence, you need to monitor everything that is happening in your environment and put safeguards on what people are doing. And when you understand the data available on the protect, what matters the most, you can now also get the insight into the actual access and operations of the live data in real time. With this and the ability to perform analytics on the data, Get the behavior analytics to instantly identify any abnormalities that require deeper troubleshooting. But the data lifecycle does not end here. At some point, data becomes obsolete or identified as redundant, duplicate. It needs to be disposed of. All of these activities aren't one-time activities. They require constant execution in the environment as the business adjusts to the market changes or brings in new technologies that will require proper insights to achieve the end goal of monitoring how data is being concerned. So we have Voltage are bringing together our Discover, Protect and Manage for data privacy and protection. And our, on our first phase, on the unstructured side, we are bringing file analysis suite data discovery and the smart cipher uh, together on our unstructured data area, allowing you to monitor and inspect content of office documents, automatically apply policies based on content detection, Content rules are based on dictionary or regular expression. As we create this more complete solution and now not as separate features, we are creating a simple single solution for privacy and protection by combining transparent file encryption, discovery, classification and access and control. And importantly, Smart Cipher transparently works with any data track. So as a SaaS solution, one main pane of glass for all, where you will be able to find and analyze the data. 
who will be able to decide on what action should be taken to protect it. Ultimately, our data discovery and protection empowers you to know your data, understand the data, and then actually do something about it by protecting that data as well as monitoring the data. So in summing up on my side, I just wanted to highlight that the, the new normal of remote collaboration leads to a lot of business transformation. Data volumes are continuing to grow, as I mentioned, and also a worrying 80 to 90 percent of unstructured data is going unused and unchecked. And this is exposing organizations to strict and ever expanding regulation, which we are seeing happening across all regions globally. So what we hope you take away today from what I've been mentioning here is to remember that discovering, managing and protecting data doesn't have to work the way it used to. Meaning, were you unsure what data you have, where it is, who has it, what permissions are in place, and let's not forget where you employ encryption, you must now remove it in order to use it. We now make this happen transparently. Users don't need to be replied upon to protect the right information, therefore reducing your risk. Your business is gaining visibility and control over how those files are used in order to meet the privacy and compliance requirements. And ultimately, you will be improving confidence level that your users working with unstructured structure to collaborate will now be sure that those files will continue to be protected, even if downloaded or content copied to another file, as our classification and protection policy will be applied at the endpoint and therefore reducing costs. So with that, I want to say thank you to Sid and pass it back over to, to you. Thanks, Anthony. I think we are at the uh, last phase of, of the presentation, so wanted to give you a preview of uh, the next generation voltage. Uh, Anthony already talked about you know, what we're doing in that space, how we're kind of bringing uh, the different capabilities together. Uh, so this is just a, a schematic of of the new voltage platform uh, that obviously is a very logical uh, diagram at this point of time, but just gives uh, or paints the idea around how we're trying to bring in you know, these different applications uh, across the portfolio, like voltage secure data, like structured manager, file analysis suite, smart cipher, secure mail, all of these you know, running on a single platform, leveraging a common set of services um, and a common UI. And then uh, basically the use cases that are going to be uh, addressed you know, by this you know, platform. Now, even of course on, on the pricing and how consumption is actually measured, uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, you know, that we have to work on in terms of uh, uh, measuring uh, the consumption of each of these services and converging to a single uh, unit of measure. So that kind of uh, brings us uh, to the end of the session. Uh, I hope uh, you found uh, the session uh, useful. Uh, so we'll be looking forward uh, uh, to your feedback. And of course, you know, feel free to get back to us with any questions. Uh, Anthony, any, any parting thoughts on your side? Thank you very much for uh, doing this together. Thank you, sir. Get social with us. Twitter, LinkedIn, Get Social, Microfocus Universe.